We've been uh, teaching on being uncommon believers. Uh, you know, we definitely believe in the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, we believe that he died and he paid the price uh, for us to live this great life. But we also know that it requires faith for us to access the grace that he died for. Uh, it does require uh, us to walk in and have faith in order for these things uh, that, that he has, you know, paid this great price for, for them to manifest themselves in our lives. So this whole series has been about uh, being uncommon, having uncommon believing, have the faith to believe God for all that he's done. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I can tell a lot of Christians, they've read the Bible, they hear all these great things that God says, but unfortunately in the back of your minds, some of you are still struggling with failure. Some of you are still struggling with marital problems. Some of you are still struggling with health problems. Some of you are still struggling with family problems. And in the back of your mind, you got to be saying, if grace did it all, why am I not walking in it? Right? Yeah. Amen. I mean, we all, listen, if, if anybody tells you as a Christian, you've never had questions to God or about God, they're probably lying to you because there are things that go on in all of our lives every day that sometimes will have us say sometimes, Lord, where are you? Or Lord, what's going on? Or Lord, what did I do? I mean, these things do go on in the minds of Christians. And it doesn't mean you're a bad Christian. It doesn't mean you don't have faith. It doesn't mean those things. You know what it means? It means that you're human. Say, it means that I'm human. Because we want to know. Because we want to know. But one of the things that um, I have found as a pastor, and you know, I've been doing this almost 20 years now, 20, 20 plus years. I started out in a real big church in Tampa where I served my man of God. And you know, I had an opportunity there to minister and, 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 and be in leadership. And so I've been dealing with Christians and people for a long time. And what I've come to find out to be the truth is that Christians will even blame God versus looking inward. And the whole purpose of the gospel of Jesus we need, to, we need to get a revelation of is to cause us to look inward. When we look inward, we're going to hear from the Holy Spirit. When we look inward, we're going to get guidance from the Holy Spirit. When we look outward and we look to blame others and blame things and blame this and blame that, that's never going to help you grow. You know why? Because you cannot change others. You cannot change circumstances. You cannot change situations. The only thing you truly can change is yourself. That's it. So the reason why God doesn't want us looking at others is because it doesn't profit us anything. Yeah, I have people all the time ask me, Pastor, where does it say in the Bible, I can't drink? Well, it don't. It don't. And all those churches you've been to that try to condemn you because you drink. You, listen, you could, you could have a bottle of Mad Dog 2020 <laughs> at hospice when you're going to heaven. <laughs> and you're still going to go to heaven, honey. I, I hate to tell you. I hate to be the preacher to have to let you know that. Pastor, where does it say, you know, I can't gamble. I like to play the lotto every now and then. It don't. It don't say nowhere in the Bible that you can't gamble. Matter of fact, God makes it real simple. He said when you're grown, you can do whatever you want. He says it this way in his word. All things, say all things, all things. Are, permissible. are permissible. You know what the word permissible means? It means you can do it. But watch this. Say this with me. But. But. See, but cancels out everything that was said. That's right, that's right. It says, he says, God says, all things are not what? Profitable. That's right. Say profitable. profitable. See, you buy things today that are permissible, but they're not profitable. Why? Because they have no appreciating value. The number one, the number one investment most people have is an automobile. An automobile is the worst investment you could ever make. But you'll live in a raggedy apartment and drive an $80,000 Cadillac. Why? Because you're trying to attract something outward versus what's going on inward. 
You need something to make you feel good. Let people look at you and see some facade, see some lie of who you are to make you feel good about you. Say profitable. profitable. It's not profitable. And it's tough to do some of these things. I was talking to a young lady the other day. We're, we're doing some stuff in, uh, relative to fire. And you know, I shared with her. I said, this thing that you're about to go through is the toughest thing you'll ever go through in your life. The hardest thing I ever had to do in my life was learn how to live on a budget. <laughs> Finally, I told the Lord, I said, Lord, you just got to increase me beyond the budget. I I'm just not a budget guy. That's why I don't touch the finances of the church. I let my wife do that. I am not the budget guy. You know, we wanted to have ribs and chicken. The guy said, well, you know, if you have brisket, that's $5 a person more. I said, I don't care. I want some brisket. <laughs> Pastor, don't worry about the bread. We eating brisket today. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. So all of this starts if you're going to begin to do anything in God. Um, want to see your life transform. Want to see things in your life get better, whether it's you, whether it's your marriage, whether it's things at work, whether it's your relationship with your children, whether it's relationship with your finances. No matter what it is, you're going to have to understand God's language. And God's language is love. The Bible says God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. He sent Jesus just to die for us. Let's see what Paul says about it. Go to 1 Corinthians. He's talking to the church of Corinth here. And they were having some issues. You know, what's funny is you read all through the Bible, you see all these churches, man, were having, you know, there was a lot of things going on. Amen? It wasn't all good things. Some were too far in religion. Some were too far in grace. God wants you in the middle. God doesn't want your religion, God, but God also doesn't want you to think everything's just going to be given to you because it's not. It is done for you, but it's not given to you. Amen? Amen? I've been thinking about that a lot lately. I've been thinking about writing my new will. And, you know, I thought about it because at one time I was just going to leave my kids a bunch of money. But I thought about that. I'm, I'm going to change that. God wouldn't just give them a bunch of stuff. God would make them have to. They need to do some stuff to prove that they deserve it. Amen? Amen. We, don't, we don't do what we do for God to get God to do anything for us. He's already done it. We do what we do for God to get the doubt out of our mind that he's already done it. Amen. Th that's what we do. We, don't, we, we can't increase our faith. You can study the word, oh, I'm going to get stronger in my faith. If you can get stronger in your faith, that means what Jesus did on the cross wasn't good enough. We don't need to get stronger in our faith. We need to get the doubt out. Say, I need to get the doubt out. What doubt? The doubt that God has already done it. Jesus has already done it. He's accomplished it all. All you have to do is believe, but you can't believe with doubt. So it does require you to do something, not to do something for God to do something, because he's already done it. It requires you to do something so the doubt then goes away. And now you can believe, because it's only your believing that's going to allow God to do anything in your life. And to believe anything about God, you first got to understand his love. You got to understand in your heart how much he loves you. And then you got to understand what salvation really is. Because how many of you know most of us in here have been taught to be saved means miss hell and go to heaven. Can I, anybody believe that? Is that how y'all were taught? Raise your hand. You get saved so you don't what? Right? And then they teach you got to do all this stuff to what? Stay saved. Right? That's all a lie. You, you've been bewitched. I'm just telling you. The word saved comes from the Greek word soteria. That word means nothing missing, nothing lacking, and nothing broken. We don't need, we know when we get to heaven everything's going to be perfect because heaven is what? Perfect. So what does he mean by nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken? Salvation happens right on this earth. Yeah, you're going to go to heaven. But how many of y'all know God wants us to have some heaven on earth too? He wants us to have some good stuff on earth. He wants us to have peace on earth. He wants us to have love on earth. He wants us to have joy on earth. He wants us to have prosperity.
eternity on earth. He wants to have health, healing, and family on earth. Amen. Not just in heaven. We already know what's going to happen when we get to heaven. And all the preachers, all they want to do is talk about heaven. That's all they talk about because they ain't doing nothing on earth. Do you understand me? God wants us to be the example of his love. Watch it. I'm going to show it to you right here. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to read in the Amplified Bible. It's just a more contemporary version of the King James. It says in verse 13, verse 1, chapter 13, verse 1. He says, if I can speak, this is Paul talking, in the tongues of men and even of angels, but have not love. That reasoning, intentional, spiritual devotion, such as inspired by God's love for and in us, I am only a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Yeah, yeah. Let me read that one more time. If I can speak in tongues of men and even as angels, but have not love, that reasoning, intentional, Spiritual devotion, such as inspired by God's love for us, I am not. I am only a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. How many of y'all know love is important to God? Watch what else he says. He says, and if I have prophetic powers, now he's talking to all the preachers. See, because love can't start until the preachers start operating in love. And the preachers can't operate in love as long as they're operating in religion. Yeah. All they want to tell you about is what you're doing and not doing. We don't serve a do and not do God. We serve a God that loves us unconditionally. And our, our receiving that love unconditionally should prompt us to want to see others receive it. He says, if I have a prophetic powers... The gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose and understand all the secret truths and the, and the mysteries and possess all knowledge. You see that? All knowledge. And if I have sufficiency, faith, so that I can remove mountains but have not love, God's love in me, I am nothing. I am a useless nobody. Say love. See, God's love is different. God's love is very different. You know, one of the things I've been teaching about when I've been teaching about being uncommon, the true sense of you being uncommon in God is can you act in love in uncommon? Can you forgive? I got family members that won't even forgive their own mother, children that won't forgive their mothers and fathers. Mothers and fathers that won't forgive their children. Sisters that won't forgive each other. I'm not talking about in the world. I'm talking about in the church. What hope is there for the world if we got husbands and wives that can't forgive each other? Yeah. We got husbands and wives that can't love beyond whatever you view your husband or, or you view your wife's shortcoming as. What, what chance do we have as a church? As the great church that Christ is coming back for. You, know, you hear a lot of preachers always talking about Jesus is right around the corner. How many of y'all hear people say that? I don't know. I got to tell you. I read the Bible. I think Jesus is a long way from coming back. Why you say that, Pastor? Man, that, man, every preacher out there says he's right around the corner. Well, it says he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. Like I said, man, I don't know. Do you realize that Sunday is the most segregated day in America? Amen. The white folks go to the white church. The black folks go to the black church. The Mexicans, they go across the street. <laughs> the Puerto Ricans, they go down the corner. Oh, I'm serious. The most segregated day in our country. You think God's happy with that? Black folks can't come because the, the, the you know, the, the pastor's white. We can't go, can't go serve or listen to a white man. The white people can't go because the preacher's black, but that black man can't teach me nothing. My spiritual father's a black man. And I've had people, Christian ministers, come up to me and say, I just got to ask you, a, just got just to gotta ask you a question. <laughs> how, how can you have a black spirit? 
I just look around, how can you be an idiot? I mean, I don't, I don't know, man. Help a brother out. How can you be that ignorant? But what's funny is while all of y'all are laughing at me, I'm sure some of the African Americans in this church have had family members tell y'all that, and, and you let them tell you that. Well, I, you know, he, you know, he this, or you say something, you know, something about, it ain't got nothing to do with me. What you need to tell them is Jesus said, know me now, no more after the flesh, but after the spirit. <clears throat> no one thing, when people start talking about color, no, they, they ain't got no God in them. I don't care who it is. I don't care what color it is. If that's your focus, the black man and the white man, you need to go get saved. Because you definitely don't understand God. Amen. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm just telling you. Somebody tell me, I, told, I, I don't see color. I'm sorry. I know you can't understand that. I know you can't figure that out. I, my church ain't a black church or a white church or a Mexican church. Or, it's God's church. Amen. That means whoever wants to come, come. We're going to love you. Amen. Amen. Now, I, you know, I'm an equal opportunity. Man, I pick on the black folks. I pick on the Puerto Rican folks. Only folks I don't pick on are the Italian folks because we're the best. <laughs> Man, you know, I'm just telling y'all. I guarantee you Jesus is Italian. I guarantee it. When I get to heaven, he's going to have on some pointy toe shoes, a double-breasted suit, Stetson hat. Black folks didn't come up with all that. Italians came up with that now. All of that stuff says made in Italy. <laughs> but you know the funny part is these are the ignorant conversations that we find ourselves in every day. Yeah. We really do. It's so sad. It's so sad. And we're supposed to be Christians. We're supposed to be different. Uncommon. Uncommon. Common people talk about color. Uncommon people talk about people. That's right. That's all we want to know. People. Watch this. He says, even verse three he says, even if, even if I dole out all that I have to the poor and providing food, and if I surrender my body to be burned or in order that I may glory, but I have not love. God's love in me, I am nothing. Watch what he says here. Love endures long. And love is patient. And love is kind. Love never ends. Uh, it is not envious or boils over. Or with jealousy. It is not boastful or vainglorious. It does not display itself haughty. Do you see that? Yeah. That's what love is. So Paul talks centrally here about love. And he talks about as Christians and as we're in the world and as we're developing this community, he shares that everything we do, no matter what we do, it must first be rooted in the foundation of it must be love. So ask yourself that as you move forward today and tomorrow and next week, when you're getting involved in things, when you're in conversations, you heard Miss Aaron say up here very clearly, our words have power. Our words have power. The, our words have so much power. God says, do not even be involved in worthless conversations. That means you're going to have to watch some of the people you talk to. Don't get involved in when somebody's already made up their mind. I had to do this all the time as a pastor. Because people have made up their mind to live in their will, not God's will. And once they make up that mind, that wall comes up. You just got to, that's where the Bible talks about don't cast your pearls among swine. What do you do? Love them. Love them. And let me say something else while I'm talking about love. Let me tell you what love doesn't mean. Love does not mean as Christians that we're doormats. That's right. Love does not mean as Christians that we just put up with and take anything that anybody does to us. 
But what it does mean is that we're cordial, we're nice, and, 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 and hey, we, we get it. I love you, but you know what? I got to, right now, for this relationship, I just have to keep you at arm's distance because you don't want to grow, you don't want to evolve. All you want to do is challenge and, 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 and test at every point. That's not love. You have to make a decision to come together and how to treat each other. Go to Colossians. Let me show you this. Colossians. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We'll give you a Bible. We're a teaching church. I'm not a dancing bear. I'm not going to dance and hoop and holler up here for you. But I am going to teach you something. Something my spiritual granddaddy told me a long time ago when I first started out. And I never forgot. He said, all inspiration with no information leads to no revelation. Let me say it again. I asked Pastor Dollar a question. He's my spiritual grandfather in the Lord. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. I said, well, you know, because I came out of the Baptist church. And I asked him, I said, you know, Pastor Dollar, man, you know, you go to the Baptist church, folks are dancing and shouting and they're doing all this stuff. And then they walk out and, man, it's, it's like it's the same thing. And he shared with me. He said, son, he said, anytime you're in an environment where everything is just rah, rah, and it's all inspiration, and you're not getting the information behind what's being said, you can't get revelation. And for us to grow in Christ, we have to get revelation, redemptive knowledge. The light has to come on. I've read this Bible a thousand times in 20 years. I've spent thousands and thousands and thousands of hours reading the same scriptures in different translations and in the same translation. And God never ceases to amaze me. How I'll read the exact same scripture and I'll get a whole nother revelation of what he's trying to say to me at that time. That somebody needed. That I needed. Amen? Amen. So we got to realize, man, studying the word and reading the word is vital to us as believers. It, the, the Bible says everything that pertains to life and godliness is in the book. There's nothing you can do, nothing you can want to do, nothing you can try to do that's not in this Bible. Amen. From marriage, from running a business, it doesn't matter what it is. How do I get along with my sister? It's in the Bible. How do I get along with my wife? How do, how, how do I have a more intimate sexual relationship with my wife? It's right in the Bible. Right? It's right here, man. I'm just trying to tell you, everything is in the Bible. It's in the book. You want to have a more intimate relationship with your wife? Learn how God created a woman. I had to learn this. My wife had to teach this to me. I never realized, see, because a lot of men don't know this. We men are physically attracted. Right? Oh. Right? Right? The man looks, right? That's what he wants to see. Right? But women ain't attracted like that. It doesn't, man, you could stick your chest out all you want. Man, she, look. I mean, does a woman want a nice looking guy? Yeah, I guess so. But she wants her mind stimulated. She wants to know you care about her. She wants to know that you're concerned. She wants to know when you get home and all you want to do is take off your dirty boots and kick your feet up and, woman, where's my food? No, man, ain't nothing going to be good tonight. <laughs> Not with that. You're going to get your food. That's all you're going to get. But if you get home, man, you're going to get your shower and she's cooking, man, you walk up behind her and give her a little kiss. Hey, baby, how was you? Man, why, why don't you just turn all that off? Let's go, let's go just sit down at the table and tell me about your day. Oh, man, he cares about me. Oh, it's going to be rocking tonight. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Up in the treetop all day long. Y'all remember? But see, if you don't study the word, you'll never know that. Because you're going to, you're going to listen to Uncle Ray Ray tell you about it. And Uncle, Uncle Ray Ray is going to tell you, well, send her to Victoria's Secrets and let her get some sexy stuff. And, and then it's going to be good. No, it ain't. It can be as sexy as you want, but if she don't feel that you're connecting with her, it don't matter. And women, your man wants you to admire them. You've been called to be their admirer. 
So if they're going out the door and it's like, man, yeah, all right, you punk, go have a good day today. <laughs> Amen. You're fighting your man. You're trying to hit him. No, that, it, it, he, he don't want to have anything to do with you. He didn't, he didn't marry Steve. He married Sheila. You know, but he married Sheila and she became Steve every now and then. Man, I don't know how I got on that. That was from the Holy Spirit for somebody. Colossians. Y'all better. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Hallelujah. Colossians chapter 3 starting in, in verse 13. Now we're talking about loving each other. So we talked about love has to be the foundation. Now let's look at one another. Uh, Colossians chapter 3 verse 13 it says, Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Y'all see that? If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Verse 14. And above all things, put charity, which is interpreted love there, which is the bond of what? Perfectness. So you got to put on love relative to one another. Relative to one another. This is talking about us now. And it goes back to what I said, if you can't forgive your daughter, or you can't forgive your mother, or you can't forgive your uncle, or you can't forgive somebody that's your blood relative, what chance is there for the church? What chance is there for the country? What chance is there for the nation? Now again, love is not being trampled on. But love is being able to, you know, I mean, come on. Got to get along with some folks. You've got to stop being so difficult to get along with. Some of y'all are, some of y'all are, somebody put 20 bucks up there? Hey, look at that, man. No, it didn't fall out the sky. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, whoever blessed me. I appreciate it. Somebody got up here and got my towel, put some money up there. Anyway, um, you know, we, we have to get over um, just hatred. There's a lot of hate right now with people. I'm not talking about just racial hate. I'm talking about people within households. Yeah. Families, man, just hating each other. Yeah. We gotta get over that. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta, the Bible says we gotta love one another. So how do we do all this? Well, Pastor, that all sounds good, but guess what, man? You know, so and so did me dirty. You know, my Aunt Judy slept with my husband and, and you know, so she did me dirt, dirty and this happened and whatever. Because, listen, everybody has an excuse. Everybody has a reason why they can't love. Everybody will tell you, yeah, but, but. You know, like God don't know all things. Y'all act like God don't know all things. God knows what, they, what happened. So in second, in Philippians chapter 2, let's see, let's see what it says here. How, how do we make this happen? Y'all okay? Amen. I'm not boring, y'all, am I? No, no, no. All right. Philippians chapter 2. Like I told you, we're going to learn something today. And if you write down the scriptures, there'll be good scriptures for you to reference back to when you start struggling with love. See, it's not going to just happen neither. Say this with me. Nothing, nothing. just happens. Yes. So it's going to take you doing some stuff to figure this out. First Corinthians, uh, Philippians. Chapter 2, it says, verse 1, it says, If there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, of any bowels or mercies, fulfill you my joy, that you be like-minded. Are y'all looking at this? Having the same what? Love. love. Being of what? One accord of what? One mind. So in other uh, for us to operate in love, we got to be of one accord. We got to be of one mind. It says right there with who? Pastor Nick, right? No, with Christ. We got to be of one accord and we got to be of one mind with Christ. Watch what he says. Let nothing 
be done through strife or vainglorious. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than what? Themselves. Can't always be about you. It can't always be about what you're going to get or how you're going to profit or how does it benefit you. If you can't give your own wife favor, how are you going to give somebody else favor? If you can't be a blessing to your own child, how are you going to bless others like God calls you to bless them? Some of y'all want to know why you're always broke. I got a simple question for you. When was the last time you did something for somebody else? And you want to know why you're broke? You got to sow some seed. The Bible says in Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over cell. What? Men. God will cause men to give into your bosom. That's right. But that's a long process. And the first step in that process is the what? Give. Yeah. And you don't want to know why you don't have it. Well, I ain't going to give it to the preacher because he's going to. Man, look, man, I could care less what any preacher does with my money. God told me to give. Once I give it, I'm looking to God Amen. to prosper me. Amen. Man can't prosper me for what I'm believing for. Amen. Amen. We're believing for one billion souls to be transferred, transformed for the body of Christ. Amen. Say billion. billion. Ain't no man knows about that. Yes. No man can bless me enough for that to happen. That's got to happen from God. Amen. It's only my job to hear and do as he tells me to do. It's on him to produce the harvest of what he said. The Bible says in Isaiah, my word cannot go forth and come back vain, void, or non-productive, but it must accomplish that in which you sent it forth to prosper in, if you'll just believe. But some of you can't believe because you don't study the word. Some of you can't believe because you don't read the word. Some of you can't believe because you don't praise God. Some of you can't believe because you don't focus on God. You focus on all the things of the world. Your whole focus, your whole desire is to look, be like, smell like, act like the world. And you want to know why God can't do it. God ain't going to do it. Amen. Well, Pastor, I don't know. My life is it's pretty good like this without, without God. Just doing it this way I want to do it. Okay, just keep living. Just keep living. I ain't met a gangster yet that didn't cry out for Jesus on his deathbed. And I met a lot of them. I'm talking about real, real bad people. Not these TV gangsters y'all watch. Oh yeah, they all, they all come back. The Bible says you may come back lame, blind, or crippled, but you're coming back. Where was that? Philippians, right? Verse 4, he says, Look not every man... Unto his own things, but every man also unto the things of others. Now watch what he says after he talks about thinking about others. Verse 5. Y'all all know this scripture. Let this mind be in you, which is what? Also in Christ Jesus. See, we read one part of it. We can all say, man, let this mind be in me that is in Christ Jesus. But see, we don't read the word, so we don't know what Paul was talking about. He was talking about love others. Do for others. Tend to others. That's the mind of Christ. When all you're doing is focusing on you, that's your mind. When it's only about how you look, how you feel, how your family has, what your family's doing. Getting mine. I got to get mine. How many people have heard that before? I'm going to get mine. You get yours. That ain't God. That's not God. Now, True enough that your first ministry is your family and you need to tend to your family. But the only way you can tend to your family is by doing for others because as you do for others and as you sow outward, God is going to bless you inward. Yes. Do you understand that? As we sow and as we do and as we give, and watch this, right where we are. Don't wait for everything to get perfect to start giving. Don't wait for everything to, to go next door to your neighbor's house and just introduce yourself. Say, hey, neighbor, my name is uh, Mike Sawyer, man. I live right next door to you. Just want to let you know I was here, man. Check on you. See if you need anything. Man, if there's ever anything I can do for you, let me know. You look a little fat, man. I own a gym. You want to come to the gym? <laughs> just joking. I could talk about fat people. Man, I'm fat. I could tell fat jokes. 
But I'm just saying, whatever it is, whatever it is, just, just show love. Show outward love. It can't just always be about you. Amen? Amen? Now, we need to also understand, especially when it comes to church and the Christian church, is that we're all members, but we all have specific roles. And we don't need to get caught up with worrying about, you know, you, you see the preachers all the time talking about Joel Osteen. Everybody's always Joel this and Joel that and Joel this and Joel don't teach the word. And Joel, man, listen, Joel's in his lane. Amen. Joel's doing a lot better than you're doing while you're looking at Joel talking about Joel. You're looking at Joel on TV. You can't get three people in your church. Shut up. <laughs> Stay in your lane. God's given us all something to do. The Bible says we're all parts in particular. Yes, yes. And we come together to make a body. How many of you know the finger don't do what the elbow does? Right? right? Amen. And the leg don't do what the arm does, right? They do different things. That's how the body of Christ is. Amen? Let's look at this. Go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Don't worry. We're going to be eating pretty soon. I, I kind of feel it now. I feel the eat spirit coming. Oh, I feel y'all. Yeah, baby. It's going to be good, too. I only got about nine more scriptures. Oh, yeah. I'm going to get my money's worth out of this. I'm going to get 5,000 out of this sermon for sure. Amen. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 12, verse 4. It says, for as, as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body of Christ, and every one members one to another. So what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying when it comes to what your other folks are doing, don't just love them. Maybe they're doing something different. As long as they're in the body, as long as they're in the church, as long as they're in Christ and they're doing, just love them. And if they're not, love them anyway. Amen? Amen? Nobody ever got me to go to church by prodding me to go. I had people try for 20 years to get me into church. I would not go. Period. I don't want to have nothing to do with church folks. Don't want to have nothing to do with church men. They're punks. Amen. Church men are weak men. That used to be my motto. Because I didn't know what a real man was. I let the streets define me as a man. Not God define me as a man. Being a man of God is about being responsible and taking care of your family. Being a man of God is about being able to love the unlovable. That's what being a man of God is. Being a man of God is being able to do things, let your family be effective to others and do for others. That's what being a man of God is. And when you start doing those things, ain't nothing punkish about that. Nothing. That's what it, a re, anybody can have all that male bravado crap. That's all that is. Insecure men thinking they're tough guys. Well, know what a tough guy is? A tough guy is a man that loves people, his wife, situations, circumstances through tough things. That's what a tough person is, tough in Christ. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, you don't have to turn there. It says, where two or three of us are gathered together in his name, there will we be in the midst of. So when we think about love and we think about unity now, so unity is us coming together. Why? Because as we come together, why do we come together? We don't come to church just to say we come to church. We don't come to church to religiously punch the clock. We come to church because the Bible says iron sharpens iron. That's right. And it says when we come together, we come together as a body to edify and build each other up and to help each other. Do what? Love more like God loves. Because as we love more like God loves and as we focus ourselves on being and acting and having the mind of Christ, our lives will get better as a result of that. Amen. Amen. Watch this. Um, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Amen. Hebrews chapter 10. We're talking about love still. Talking about us considering each other still. I'm going to read this in the Amplified. Hebrews chapter 10, I want to read verse 24 and 25. Hebrews chapter 10, 
verse 24 and 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. I'm reading the Amplified. It says, and let us give attentive, continuous care to watch over one another. Do you see that? Let us give continuous, attentive care to watch over one another of us, studying how we may stir up, stimulate, and incite to love and helpful deeds and noble activities. You see that? He literally talks about stirring ourselves up to do acts of love. Verse 25, not forsaking or neglecting to assemble, to gather together as believers. Are y'all seeing this? As it is the habit of some people, by admonishing, warning, urging, and encouraging one another. So we gather together as believers to urge, to encourage, to warn. The purpose of coming to church this is why Paul is talking here. And he's saying that we come we got to come together as believers, loving one another, to encourage one another as believers. That's why we do what we do for just why Christ gave his life for the church. Church ain't just about you, it's about others. He says, one another, and all the more faithfully as you see the day approaching. So we see that's why we gather together as believers. So when we gather together, man, let's not gather together and gossip. Let's gather together as believers, not church folks. Church folks is a term. We are believers. We need to gather together as believers to build each other up, to encourage each other. To share with each other the great things that God is doing in our lives. Why? Because it's good. John got up here and gave a testimony a couple of weeks ago. A member of ours was in the hospital for 60 days. Anybody ever even heard of somebody being in the hospital for 60 days? That's a long time. But guess what? He made it out. And he just had his final surgery three days ago, and he is great. On his way to total healing. So what was the point? He's now God, he can be used as a vessel to encourage somebody else who's having a tough time. Go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Y'all all right? I'm, all, I'm getting done. I know. I hear it. I hear the stomachs growling. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians. I want to read this in the Amplified as well. I'm going to start at verse 11. Watch this. In verse 11, he says, Therefore encourage, admonish, exhort one another, and edify, strengthen, and build up one another, just as you are doing. Now also we beseech you, brethren, to get to know those who labor amongst you. Recognize them for what they are, acknowledge, appreciate, and respect them all. He says, your leaders who are over you in the Lord and those who warn and kindly reprove and exhort you. So he's talking about all of us as a body. The members love each other. The leaders, man, when your leader is correcting you or your leader is, is, is trying to get you to see something, it's because he loves you. He ain't telling to you to, to get you mad. Sometimes we get so offended at everything. This said to us. Why? Because we don't want to change. Sometimes we need to be corrected so that we can change. He goes on saying, verse 13, and hold them in very high and most affectionate esteem and intelligent and symbolic appreciation of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. Verse 14, he says, And we earnestly beseech you, brethren, that you admo to admonish, warn, and seriously advise those who are out of line, the loafers, the disorderly, and the unruly, and encourage the timid 
and the faint-hearted. Help and give your support to the weak souls and be very patient with everybody, always keeping your temper. See, that's some deep love right there. Yeah. You got to love folks. See, y'all just want to love people when, when they do what you want them to do. I watch Christians. Let me tell you, this was, a, this was probably one of my most, there's been many days I've been, Ashamed to call myself a Christian. But probably one of the greatest days was just the other day, this uh, white woman shot and killed this black man, in, or black woman, I'm not sure, in their apartment. And the family of the, the, the black man, the young black man was a, a, they're a family of believers. And this young man gets up and forgives this woman for what she did to his brother. I'm talking about really forgave. I'm not talking about just I'm talking about I loved her, encouraged her to get saved, encouraged her to give her life to Christ, told her she needed to forgive herself because if she didn't, her whole life would be ruined. Do you know that Christians, yes. Christians attack this man? Christians, not the world, Christians. The world was impressed. The world couldn't believe it. But not Christian folk. Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm not that saved. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. That's not, what, that's not what God meant. Well, just think about yourself. And think about, well, maybe some of y'all can't do this. I know what I was before I met Christ. Some of y'all thought y'all were good even before you met Christ. But think about the fact that God gave Jesus to die for you and who you were, where you were, how you were. So don't tell me what love is. Love is an unconditional love. Now, let me say this before I get on to my, my last part here. When pastor's talking, I am not saying any of what I'm telling any of y'all is easy. Nothing in God is easy. Nothing, doing anything by faith is not easy. It takes us praying and hearing from the Holy Spirit and being guided by the Holy Spirit and then letting the word of correction come and being adjusted and then praying and hearing from the Holy Spirit and then coming to church. You get a little correction. You get a little encouragement. It's a process that we go through life. It's not easy, but we can never, ever change God's word to make us want to more easily accept it. God's words always put there to challenge us to transform to what it is. Amen? Amen. That's all I'm telling you. Amen? So we need to understand God loves us in closing. We need to understand God loves us. Like I told you earlier, the word salvation doesn't mean miss hell and go to heaven. The word salvation comes from the Greek word soteria, which means nothing missing, nothing lacking, and nothing broken. The Bible says in the book of John, chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes in order to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, I have come that you have life and have it more abundantly. In the Amplified Bible, he says, I have come that you have and you enjoy life, that you have and you enjoy life to the full until it overflows. Say overflow. God don't want you just paying the rent. God, you don't want you just paying the lights. God don't want you just getting by financially. Yeah. God don't want you just tolerating your marriage. God don't want your kids just, you know, let me just, just get them out the house. God wants everything you put your hands to, to prosper. Yeah. It can't prosper unless you make a decision to pursue God. You can't pursue God until you make a decision to love. Love is the first thing. Paul said it. Stop worrying about having faith to move mountains. Stop worrying about trying to be the biggest preacher in the world. Stop worrying about trying to be the greatest prophetic psalmist there is. Learn how to love. Learn how to love. Learn how to love like Christ loved unconditionally. Because he loves you. He loves me. He loves us. He gave his son Jesus, not just so, again, that we can go to heaven. 
He gave Jesus so that we could have life and we could have it more abundantly. And as we pursue Christ and not things, as we pursue Christ and the mission of God, he says in Matthew 6, seek ye first the kingdom of God. See, the problem is y'all been taught in church that means heaven. No, it don't. The kingdom of God is God's way of thinking. Seek ye first God's way of thinking, which is what? Love. Love outwardly. And he says, all these things shall be added. But see, we do it in reverse. We ain't naming and claiming and blabbing and grabbing love. No, we're naming and claiming the car. We're naming and claiming the house. We're naming and claiming the jet. We're doing all these things. And we're missing the first part of what God has called us to do. To learn how to love. So that now we could be an example. Oh, and it, don't, don't skip me. Get behind me. Oh, no, no. You need to go, young lady. Go, go ahead. It's all right. I'm all right. That's why it says love is patient. See, I, I'm working on my love, my love walk when it comes to driving. Because, you know, that big old Range Rover, I can just scoop folks right up. Get, no, no, you ain't getting in here. And I got good insurance. I ain't scared neither. Yeah, I go to start to do that, and, and Jesus taps me on that shoulder. Love. Let him in. You ain't in no hurry. How you know that's not a single mom trying to get to work? She's got to be on work all the time. You don't even have to go to work. Ha, ha, ha. How about that, Satan? That's what I tell him. Maybe she's got to get to work. Maybe she's, there's a reason. Nah, they're just being a jerk. So you're going to be a jerk back? What, what does that help? You know the way they treat me, Pastor. So that's how you're going to treat them? You know, the Bible talks about this thing about, it says this, and I don't mean to discourage anybody here, but it says, you know, when you love the lovable, you haven't even done anything. They're lovable. Anybody can love the lovable. It's when you love, when you can love the unlovable. When you can love those that don't deserve. This is, this is the thing I'm getting ready. I'm really going to have a real serious talk with my leadership about. Because if we're going to do folks in the church like they do us, how are we leaders? We got to be that example. Oh, hold on. You want me to take her to lunch the way she talked to me? Yeah, I do. And if you can't, then maybe you don't need to be a leader. Maybe you just need to just get yourself together and go figure out what being a leader in the army of God is all about. Because being a leader in the army of God is about loving the unlovable. Anybody can love somebody that's easy to love. Oh, I know, man. God does it. Let me tell you, man. And let me tell you something. When you're ready to get promoted, God will put some un unlovable folks in your life. Lord knows I've, I've, I've had some. But you got to still love them. And you can just pray. Sometimes it's praying for them. You don't have to be all in their face to prove that you love them. Sometimes it's not responding the way you used to would respond to the unlovable. There used to be a time some folks, you know, my, some of my family members, my brother, or, you know, even my mom would say some things to me. Some of my kids would say some things to me. And I would respond kind of different. You know, back before Pastor Nick was real, real, real saved. <laughs> I and mean, I'm still, you know, I still miss it too. Amen? Amen. I want to read this to you. Um, first thing I want to do, I just want to cover this. Y'all need to understand the Bible says in Mark 9, 23, and I just got to make sure you get this. All things are possible to them that believe. That's it. it doesn't say all things are possible to them that wish. It doesn't say all things are possible to them that hope. It doesn't say all things that are, the, all things are possible to them that believe. This is why the grace message is so tough for Christians to get. Well, if you already did it, why ain't I walking in it? Because you got to believe. You still have to believe. And we don't do what we do to get God to do more. God's already done it. We do what we do so our believer yes. can believe. That, that's all there is to it. Your mama can tell you she loves you all she wants. But if you're laying in the bed sick and she don't come see about you, how many of you know you're going to start questioning whether your mama loves you or not? Because love is a what word? Action. It's an action word. So we truly love God. We should want to do things for his kingdom, for what he set up. 
He set this up, not us, not man. He did. He died for the church. He says right here in Hebrews chapter 13. I just want to read this to y'all. Because I want y'all to know how much God loves you today. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5. I'm going to read this out of the Amplified Bible. He says, let your character and your moral disposition be free from the love of money, including greed, obviousness, lust, and watch this, craving for earthly possessions. Craving. Man, I got this new iPhone, the, the, the 11. Y'all see all the little, all the little, you know, people sleep outside overnight to wait to get these things. I'm a craving. People see people come by in cars and just lust at a car. A car. He says this right here, man. Don't get into craving. He says, but be satisfied with your present circumstances and with what you have. Watch this. For he, God, himself said, this is what I want y'all to hear today. I will never in any way fail you nor give up nor leave you without support. I will not, I will not, I will not in any degree leave you helpless, nor forsake you, nor let you down, nor relax my hold on you. Assuredly not. Do you see that? Amen. I will not, I will not, I will not he said, even relax his grip on you. God loves you. God wants the best for you. God wants you operating in what, what I call the believing side of life. And in order to get there, you got to first start loving one another, creating unity in your relationships that's going to create unity in your community. It starts right in your family. And then it permeates outside of that. And as you love, now you're going to be able to step into that area called the believing side of life. Where he says in Mark that if you say unto the mountain, believe in your heart and not doubt. See that? Not doubt those things which you have said. You will have whatsoever you say. How many of y'all want, want to see some things in your life change? Yes. So if you wonder why things aren't going on, why is this happening to me? Why is that? I just challenge you today, over the next week, examine your love walk. Examine your love walk at home first with your husband or your wife or whatever. For those that are married or living in a relationship or whatever, Find something that you have not done for your spouse or your husband in a long time. Maybe your hubby likes those special pancakes. Get up one morning and cook those pancakes. For the hubby, maybe you've been making your wife cut the grass. Man, get out there and cut the grass for her. I don't know why y'all laughing. I don't cut the grass at my house. I pay somebody to cut it. My wife don't cut it, but. <laughs> but I ain't cutting it. I'm just saying. <laughs> Find something that you haven't done for somebody that you love. And do something special for them. Do something special. Start in-house. And then once you do a little bit of that and. That gets good. Then find somebody else, somebody you work with. Maybe there's somebody at the job that, you know, every once a week, you know, a few of y'all go out to eat, but they're always bringing their food. You don't have to ask, hey, you too broke to go out and eat? I'll bless you. No, that, that, you ain't blessing nobody. You being a big front. But, but, but notice that. Just tell them, hey, man, you want to come and eat with us? Yeah, I'll take care of you. Just be a blessing. Be a blessing. Maybe somebody, you know, my wife and I, we started, man, we started tithing. And then, then after that, we got to where we could tithe. We started giving. And then once we started tithing and giving, we asked the Lord, how do we sow outward now? 
We started out, my wife and I, in the church we were at, blessing single moms with pampers. That was our ministry. Man, we blessed single moms with, it cost us $5 and something to say, pampers for their kids. We went from that, God increased us. We started blessing couples with date night. We buy them dinner at Hops on Dale Mabry. I'll never forget it. We bless them, bless them with that. God promoted us from that. We started blessing families with vacations. Started blessing people with full families with vacations to Disney World, vacations here. God promoted us from that. We started blessing people with cars. Start where you I, I, I want to bless folk. No, start right where you're at. Amen. The Bible says, despite not your small beginnings. Yes. Maybe you can't buy somebody a house right now, but maybe you could buy them a meal. And maybe it's not even about buying them. Maybe it's just, maybe God's leading you to go, go just sit down with some elderly person and just go, go see about them. Maybe it's writing a letter to somebody that's in prison. I don't know what the Holy Spirit's going to lead you to do, but you got to start looking outward to do things. It can't just be about you and your world and your family and your children. And you getting, no, 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 it's got to be out. That's why the church is so important. That's why the Bible says forsake not the assembly of ourselves. Amen. Y'all get anything out of the word today? Give God some praise. Everybody stand at their feet. I just want to pray with you. Just bow your heads right where you're at. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Father, for your word. I thank you, Lord, for each person uh, that was at the sound of my voice today. Lord, I just speak, pray, and command the blessing over their lives, over their families, Lord, over their finances, over their, their health. Lord, I declare that your protection will surround them like a shield. I thank you, Father, that everything they put their hands to, Father God, in you will prosper. Come to fruition, Lord. Be productive in producing. Lord, I thank you for this word today on love. I thank you, Lord, that your word says, create in us, Lord, a clean heart and renew in us a right spirit. I thank you, Lord, as a result of your word going forth today, hearts and minds are being renewed to who you are. Lord, we love you. Lord, we honor you. And Lord, we just give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.